Hello and welcome. I'm Adele Gauthier from Breast Cancer Foundation, and tonight we're talking about genetic risk of breast cancer. Before we get started, some housekeeping. If you have any technical issues, you can type details of your problem in the chat box at the bottom left of your screen, and our support team will get in touch. Or you can call the number you'll see there and enter the passcode to get help. If you have any sound problems, you might prefer to listen on your phone while watching on your computer. You can see some instructions for how to do that at the bottom of your screen. You can use the chat box during the webinar to ask questions, which we'll get to later. And you can also talk to other people there. Don't worry about missing out on information while you're chatting. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website in the next few days. So tonight, we're talking about genetic risk of breast cancer. It's something that's been big in the headlines ever since Angelina Jolie, but a lot of us don't really know about our own family risk and what that means for us in real terms. So tonight we have four panelists who are going to share with you. Kirsty Walters and Vivian Gubb, who both have BRCA mutations. Dr. Vanessa Lattimore from the University of Otago. And Romy Kerr from Genetic Health Service. First, we're going to hear from Kirsty, who in 2007 discovered she had a BRCA mutation. Kirsty, tell us how that came to light and about the decisions you and your family have had to make. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I found out I was BRCA2 when I was 32. I'd just met my future husband. My mother's brother, my uncle, and his daughter, my cousin, developed breast cancer in the early 2000s. They subsequently undertook genetic testing and it was discovered that the BRCA2 mutation ran in our family as they were both positive. After this was established, there was a gene mutation on my mother's side. My mum and her three other siblings became eligible for testing. My mother was tested positive around the same time she also developed stage 4 ovarian cancer. Her three other siblings were all negative. I decided quite soon after that I'd like to carry out the testing after genetic counselling. I undertook the test and I was positive along with my two other older sisters. From the moment I found out I was positive, I was put on a screening program including MRI, mammogram, ultrasounds and physical examinations through Auckland DHB. I knew quite early on that I'd probably opt to have prophylactic surgery at some point and mainly I reached this conclusion by considering the statistical facts. I was I was given some great resources through genetic services, which allowed me to weigh up my age and risk profile, and it became clear to me at this point that we needed to get our family started sooner rather than later, that I could have more conclusive screening and then undertake surgery. So now that I was reasonably comfortable undertaking regular screening and focusing on getting started with a family. So we married in 2008, only a year after I found out I was positive for the mutation. He didn't run for the hills. <laughs> We were pregnant with our first daughter in, in six months after we married, and then 20 months after she was born, we had our second daughter. So things moved quite quickly. Um, during this period, this period was actually a really difficult time for me. My mum was not well with ovarian cancer. I was either pregnant or breastfeeding, so my hormones were all over the place. And I was experiencing weird hormonal things that I was unfamiliar with, and there probably wasn't a day that didn't go by that I thought I had, that I didn't think that I had cancer. During this time, though, um, having regular screening actually also allowed me time to meet with and talk with specialists at my hospital appointments. It also helped me to reach my decision. Having kids, watching them grow up, and losing my own mother then only served to solidify my decision to undertake prophylactic surgery as soon as was practical. I was really scared that I'd not be around to see my kids grow up, and I felt that, given, that I'd been given a really valuable piece of information that I could do something to reduce the risk with. Also, having just lost, having just watched my mum suffer, she died three years after her diagnosis, and also lost my father-in-law to an unrelated cancer only 12 months after losing my mum. It was all just too much. Um, during this decision-making period, I also reached out to a number of resources. One very useful resource was the Gift of Knowledge. It's a not-for-profit organisation started by an amazing woman, Nick Coombe, who's been through the BRCA journey herself. She set up an amazingly resourceful website and has regional support meetings for people at all stages of their BRCA journey. I met people there who were in the same boat as me, others who had just had surgery, others who weren't quite sure, but ultimately this just gave me an outlet to talk to those who were going through and understood exactly what I was going through. So after two kids, lots of research and weighing up the pros and cons, I 
and on heart knew that what I had to do. I wanted to remove the doubt in my mind. I was tired of the constant worry. I'd finished with using my lady bits in question and they served me well, but it was time for them to go. <laughs> After finishing breastfeeding my second daughter for nine months, I got the ball rolling for surgery. I undertook a prophylactic nipple sparing Bilateral mastectomy, it's such a mouthful. <laughs> Five years after finding out I was BRCA2 positive, I was 38 years old. I had the support of my husband and immediate family, which was really great. There was no judgment, just support. Everyone's circumstances in our family was unique, and this was the right thing for me to do. And largely I think that was because I had dependence and because cancer had been a big part of our lives more recently. My sister undertook to have the same surgery and my other sister is undergoing regular screening so far, so got on all fronts. I was very fortunate to have a great GP and I would recommend, re recommend to anyone who has been diagnosed with a uh, BRCA mutation to find a good GP, someone that understands the mutation and is well connected. My GP, GP has been amazingly proactive and has followed my journey closely. She's put me on some, to some great specialists and I feel like this has been the single most important aspect of my journey from a medical perspective. You need a GP who understands the bracket risks and will take every niggle you turn up with, false positive result and paranoia seriously and follow it through appropriately. I was also very fortunate to have an uncomplicated surgery. I was back at work in two weeks with my saline breast expanders and four months later back into my reconstructive surgery. A year after that, I also had an orthorectomy at age 40, and I'm now in surgical menopause. That's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> and on HRT. Long term, I have had no serious side effects from my mastectomy. I have scars around my nipples, and I've lost the feeling in both breasts, and have slightly weaker upper body strength. And from time to time, I get weird, uncomfortable sensations on my chest wall when lying down. It's a low-grade pain, which has been checked, and I can deal with it. The really good news is that my head is clear, I don't worry about getting cancer anymore. I can watch my kids grow up, enjoy my family, knowing that I did everything in my power to remove the risk of getting this genetic cancer. But business as usual for our family right now. Looking forward, at some point, we will need to reopen Pandora's box with our two girls. We haven't told them yet. They're seven and nine. It's not really time. Um, we'll probably broach it with them in their late teens, at which time we hope there'll be further medical advances to help with their decisions. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Kirsty. That was super helpful for people at home, I'm sure. Um, now we're going to hear from Vivian Gubb, who was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2015, and, and unfortunately that ended up being only the first problem that, that she, that she um, came across. Vivian, tell us about what happened to you and, and your family. Um, well, hi there. Um, I was diagnosed in, back in 2015 with a grade 3 triple negative breast cancer when I was only 29, which obviously was quite a bit of a shock to our family as we'd had really no instances of cancer, breast cancer in our family apart from um, my aunt on my father's side. Um, but because she was, though she was on the younger side to develop breast cancer, she was still in her 40s, which meant that there were no real red flags that flicked up, which meant they ended up not testing her for any genetic mutations. However, due to my age, the doctors were pretty certain there had to be a mutation somewhere, um, which is why I was then referred on to the genetic health services, where I was then screened for mutations in the BRCA1, the BRCA2, and the P350 genes in order to see if there's anything there. They were really helpful for the whole process. Um, they were always willing to answer our questions and allowed us to be able to get in touch any time if we had anything to follow up on. They also offered us counselling when I received my positive results for a BRCA1 mutation a couple months later. Because of my auntie having had the same type of cancer, they were able to determine that the mutation had actually come down from my father's side, which then meant that key members of my family, um, starting with my aunties and uncles, were then screened for the BRCA1 mutation. Once the positive result was then found, it then passed on through to my cousins and my sisters to be uh, opened up to be able to be screened. Uh, after I received, uh, so far we've had 10 members screen with seven having come back as a positive result and only three coming back as a negative. Overall, the family reacted to the news as would expect. Um, there was quite a bit of shock, but we found a massive amount of strength and they were absolutely amazing. We all just banded together and started supporting one another. And the good thing was is that we all followed the same mindset, that knowledge really is power and that the only way to protect ourselves and the people that we love 
was to get tested so at least we could have that knowledge to be able to take steps to protect ourselves. My aunt and I did both feel a sense of relief at being positive for the BRCA1 mutation as it did give us a bit of closure as to why we were hit with the cancer stick. It kind of gave some reason because Obviously, it was such a shock for both of us, and we were glad that it wasn't just essentially bad luck. Uh, at first, we did think that my aunt and I were the only ones who had been affected um, by a BRCA mutation, but it was later found on that two of our second cousins had actually developed ovarian cancer in their lifetime. Those of us who tested positive were then able to move forward and take steps necessary to protect ourselves. My aunt, who has already gone through cancer, chose to undergo an oophorectomy in order to be able to eliminate any risk of ovarian cancer, but she has decided not to have a double mastectomy and is continually being monitored. My cousin has chosen to have a prophylactic double mastectomy, along with my twin sister Erica, who has actually already undergone hers. Both Erica and I have made the decision to wait a few more years in order to be able to have an oophorectomy, as we're still kind of in that childbearing age and we do hope to be able to extend our family. But my father and my two uncles that have come back as a positive are essentially just being screened um, for prostate cancer um, in order to protect themselves for that. During the period of genetic testing, I was also undergoing chemotherapy and was told I would either have to have radiation therapy or a double mastectomy at the end. But I ended up choosing to opt for the double mastectomy. This was based on the obviously the positive BRCA result and the fact that I was at such a young age that the chance of me developing another cancer throughout my lifetime was quite high. So it just was kind of a no-brainer. Um, also the fact that my cancer was extremely deep and very hard to find. The doctors struggled to be able to find it because of how deep it was and it was moving into my chest wall, which meant that because of the aggressiveness of it and how fast it was growing, it meant that if I hadn't found the cancer when I did, it would have been a stage 4 cancer. So choosing the mastectomy gave me a peace of mind because it didn't mean I had to, it meant I didn't have to be scared so much if I so much felt as a ripple in my breast or had I been checking properly or essentially if I'd had another deep cancer formed and I wasn't being able to feel it. Um, so having the mastectomy meant I did have that peace of mind. I, I guess the main thing for moving forward on with a diagnosis such as this is that a positive result in a genetic mutation doesn't have to be the end of the world anymore um, as we can now take steps to reduce the risk and create a plan to move forward. We may have a greater chance of, being de of developing um, cancers, but we do have a better screening and monitoring than the rest of the general population. Overall, this means we do have a better chance at beating cancer if one has formed and essentially going on to live a relatively normal life compared to someone who may have had no idea and ended up finding out way too late. The most important thing we do have on our side, as I said, is this knowledge and the fact that we have so many people out there willing to help and support someone to get through this. I am currently a member of the BRCA New Zealand Facebook page, um, which is really a fantastic place for people to come together who have a known BRCA mutation, have family members who are or are just in the process of being tested. It does allow people to come together to ask medical questions, um, ask for opinions, vent about issues, and most importantly, find some peace of mind that they aren't the only, the only ones dealing with this. As I said, knowledge really is power, and we're very fortunate in this day and age to have so many different avenues to turn to for support. We just have to remember that we don't need to be afraid to reach our hand out for help because there will always be people willing to reach back. Great, thank you Vivian, that's really quite a story for you and your, and your family there. Um, now we're going to hear from Vanessa Lattimore. She works for the Familial Breast Cancer Study at the University of Otago and this year received a fellowship grant from Breast Cancer Foundation to support her work. Vanessa explores BRCA mutations in a lot more depth than anybody else I should, I should say and uh, she also looks at some of the other lesser known genetic variations. Um, Fire away, Vanessa. Thanks so much, Adele. Uh, as Adele mentioned, I am a research fellow based down in Christchurch, and today I'm going to give you a brief overview about a couple of the research projects that I'm currently working on. Now, I don't think I need to tell this audience that breast cancer is a significant disease. It's a significant cancer for women all around the world. One in nine New Zealand women will develop breast cancer at some stage during their lifetime, along with one in 1,000 men. And there are a large number of risk factors associated with breast cancer. And these include things such as your diet, if you smoke, what your weight is, what your personal and family history of the disease is like. 
And many of these things are environmental. So for instance, if you improve your diet or increase the amount of physical activity you do, you can actually lower your risk of developing breast cancer. But one thing you can't change is your genetics. And a small proportion of us carry mutations within our DNA that significantly increase our risk of developing breast cancer. The DNA contains the information for how you developed and how you function today. And you can kind of think about it as a recipe book in the sense that along your strand of DNA, there are segments which are like recipes. They contain the information to make proteins, and these recipes are known as genes. There are a number of genes that we know are associated with breast cancer risk, and the two most well known of these genes are BRCA1 and BRCA2. The proteins that are coded for by these genes are actually really good in that they work in a pathway that repairs your DNA if it gets damaged. Problems occur, however, when mutations are present within those sequences. And so the information that goes on to create the proteins is disrupted and the proteins might not function as they normally would, and this is thought to be behind an increased breast cancer risk, along with an increase in ovarian, prostate, and pancreatic cancers. Identifying individuals who carry these variants is very important, as it can be very important for not only the patient's management, but also treatment options. And in New Zealand, we have referral guidelines to identify the individuals who have the most highest likelihood of carrying one of these variants, and some of those guidelines are listed on the slide. Hundreds of New Zealanders undergo genetic testing every year, and each of those individuals will be returned with a test result that highlights one of three things. The first is that no high-risk pathogenic mutations have been identified, and this is returned in about 80% of the tests that are undertaken. The second is that a pathogenic mutation has been identified, and this is returned in about 10% of the tests undertaken, and this highlights that the individual does carry a known mutation that significantly increases their risk of developing breast cancer. And this is really important to detect as it can be used for patient management. The third result that can be returned is that an unclassified variant has been detected. This test result is not very useful as we don't actually know if these variants increase your risk of breast cancer or whether they're having no effect whatsoever. And this is quite problematic, especially for clinicians as they can't advise a patient about what prophylactic preventative surgery they could have undertaken or if they should have extra surveillance precautions when we don't actually know if that variant increases their risk of developing breast cancer or whether it's having no effect whatsoever. So this information can't be used for the management of those patients. In addition, clinicians don't have the resources or expertise to understand the risk of these variants themselves. And so typically, these variants are put into the too hard basket. They're filed away in the hopes that one day someone will be able to understand the risk, risk behind them. And one of the studies that I'm managing is particularly interested in the test results returned by genetic screening in New Zealand, and that's the New Zealand Familial Breast Cancer Study. This study was established in 2013 by Dr. Logan Walker with the idea of trying to better understand and interpret the genetic risk of breast cancer in New Zealanders. And the New Zealand Familial Breast Cancer Study has been modelled off a similar initiative based in Australia known as KCONFAT. KCONFAT has recruited around 1,800 families, all high risk for breast and ovarian cancer and mainly based in Australia, with the idea of trying to better understand and interpret the genetic factors that are increasing these families' risk of developing these cancers. The New Zealand Familial Breast Cancer Study has been created so that New Zealand families can be also involved in the research, such as that, that the families in Australia have been involved with. And we're particularly interested in families who have had a genetic test that has highlighted they either carry a pathogenic mutation or an unclassified variant. We're interested in those who carry a pathogenic mutation as we're interested to know why the cancer varies so much within the same family. For instance, some individuals of a family may develop breast cancer at an early age of a certain type. Some may develop it later in life with a different type. And other individuals who carry the same pathogenic mutation may never develop cancer. And we want to know why these differences occur. And are there other genetic factors influencing these differences? And can we detect them? We're interested in families who have had an unclassified variant detected 
as we want to take those variants and, and interpret them and look at them in the detail required so that we know if they are high risk variant or not, which will be more informative for those individuals. Another question that we want to answer is whether current guidelines for referring for genetic screening in New Zealand are comprehensive enough to capture all individuals who carry high risk pathogenic mutations or whether some people have been missed by these screening tools. And another study that I'm involved with is trying to answer that question. This work, we are doing targeted sequencing of several known pathogenic, even several high risk genes in 367 women who have come into Christchurch Hospital with breast cancer between 2013 and 2017. And they've all, do they've all donated tissue to the Cancer Society Tissue Bank, which we were able to access. We've extracted DNA from, these, from the tissue donators, and we've extracted DNA for BRCA1, BRCA2, and four other known high-risk breast cancer susceptibility genes. Now, we're currently in the analysis stage of this work, but to give you an idea of the results so far, I've put this diagram together. Each of the women on the slide represents one individual in the study. So far, we've identified 21 of these women who carry high-risk pathogenic mutations. And so I'm going to look at the details of each of these women to determine if they fit within the current criteria for genetic screening. And if any of them don't, can we modify that criteria in any way so in the future all pathogenic variant carriers are identified and offered genetic screening. In addition to this, we've detected 10 women who carry unclassified variants. And so we're going to look at these women, look at the variants detected in these women in more detail and using a multifactorial classification model, understand the risk behind these variants so these women get more informative results from genetic screening. Currently, there are people out there who carry high-risk mutations and they're not even aware of that risk. And that's effectively like walking around near the edge of a cliff with a blindfold on. At any moment, you may fall off the edge of that cliff and could develop breast cancer, but you're not even aware that you're at higher risk. With a higher understanding of our genetics, we can better identify these individuals and barriers can be put in place to protect them from falling off the edge of that cliff. Or if they do develop breast cancer, they're detected at a much earlier stage, which leads to better outcomes for these individuals. And this isn't just important for those individuals, it's important for their whole family, many of which will also carry the same high-risk pathogenic mutation. And so this gives them all the opportunity to know what their risk is and manage that accordingly. By continuing our research into understanding and interpreting the genetic risk of breast cancer, we can better identify individuals who are at higher risk of the disease, giving them the opportunity to know what their risk is, manage that risk, and lower the incidence of breast cancer in the future, which is the ultimate goal. Thank you. Great. Wow, that was hugely interesting. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, now, our last panellist tonight is Romy Kerr. Romy is a genetic counsellor at Genetic Health Service in Auckland, and um, which is a service offering publicly funded genetic counselling. Um, Romy, it's not always obvious who should get counselling and who shouldn't. Tell us about your work and how Kiwis can know whether they should be talking to you or not. Yeah, sure. Well, firstly, thank you to everyone for everything they've said. They've set the scene really nicely for me. Um, so, like it's already been said, I'm a genetic counsellor at the Genetic Health Service. Um, the Genetic Health Service is a public fu publicly funded service. Um, we offer genetic assessment and genetic testing to families that are found to be at high risk of inherited genetic changes, um, predisposing to cancer, among other genetic conditions as well. Um, we are made up of a multidisciplinary team. Um, it includes the clinical geneticists who are the trained doctors involved with lots of the diagnostic side of the genetics. Um, then we've got a bunch of genetic counsellors who I personally feel are the, the most important people in that team. <laughs> I'm kind of a bit biased. Um, so we are um, people with master's degrees in genetic counselling and we specialise in facilitating, facilitating conversations with families and patients, but also with scientists and um, other researchers around what's going on in genetics of breast cancer, among other things. We then also have intake assistants who are really important for helping us gather all of the information that we need in order to assess the family history. 
And then our administrative staff, who we couldn't do anything without, they make sure that everyone turns up on time. So, as ha oh, sorry, to go back to the previous one, um, New Zealand has got um, a whole a genetic health service, which is a national service, but we do have centres in Auckland and Wellington as well as Christchurch, um, and each of those hubs of the genetic service um, have outreach clinics to different parts of the country. And we also offer genetic counselling or genetic clinics um, by the telephone, so we are accessible to everyone in New Zealand. What our role is in the genetic health service is to assess those families that are at increased risk of an inherited genetic cancer. What we know from cancer is that it is multifactorial, as Nessa has already spoken about. Cancer is predominantly caused by um, sporadic things such as, as age or being a female, having breast tissue increases your risk of developing breast cancer. So most of the time, people who are diagnosed with breast cancer, it happens because of population risk or lifestyle factors. Around 20 to 30% of breast cancer diagnoses occur because of familial factors. So these are a combination of genetic and environmental factors which play into a person's risk of developing cancer. It might slightly increase their risk or slightly reduce their risk. And then around 5 to 10% of um, cancers, including breast cancer, are caused by those high-risk inherited genetic factors that Vanessa was speaking about. Um, they are the kinds of things where we can do genetic testing and potentially identify mutations in families which might indicate additional screening or um, surgical options and genetic testing in the wider family. So our role in the Genetic Health Service is to facilitate assessing those families which we think might be at an increased risk for an inherited cancer um, and determining who in those groups um, are eligible for genetic testing or where genetic testing is indicated. But we receive referrals from lots of different places and for lots of different reasons. So this um, slide here is just to demonstrate the kind of um, complexity of being referred to the Genetic Health Service and what part of my role is is to determine what needs to happen when we receive a referral. So we get referrals from GPs, from specialists. Um, we can now get referrals from breast nurses. Um, we get information about an individual and their family, and my role is to determine what to do with that information. Most of the time, we need more information, um, so then we contact the family and request information with questionnaires or family history forms. Sometimes we can um, facilitate testing immediately based on a person's diagnosis, such as a triple negative breast cancer below 40, um, sorry, below 50. Um, other times we might need, um, we might be able to just write a letter to the family and say these are what the risks look like and, and being genetic health service isn't going to necessarily change that for them. So when we gather more information, there are many things that we need to know about a family history in order to assess the risk of cancer in that family. Some of the flags for us about a, a family which might be at a, an increased risk for an inherited cancer include things like cancer in three or more close relatives on the same side of the family, cancer diagnosed in two successive generations, an early age of diagnosis, so a diagnosis of, of cancer under the age of 40, multiple primary tumours in an individual. So this is referring to those um, people who've had several types of cancer diagnosed. Um, they're not diagnoses of a secondary cancer, so a cancer that's moved from one part of the body to the other. These are separate events um, of cancer diagnosed in the same person. Tumours that are consistent with a, um, with a cancer specific to inherited breast or ovarian cancer. So for example, um, the histo histology of certain cancers that can be more linked um, to those um, with a BRCA mutation than others. So we get medical records and histology from individuals in the family to try and clarify whether that's what's going on. And then, of course, the presence of a mutation in the family. If someone has had genetic testing and a mutation has been identified, then that's obviously quite a big flag for us that that's probably what's going on in the family. Um, but we do require the report from the relative who's had the genetic testing because um, genetic testing is complicated. And it's helpful for us to have a report so that we know that we're looking for the right thing. So in the diagram on the slide you can see is a picture of a pedigree. Um, so this is just a drawing of a family. The circles are women and the squares are men. In this made up family, um, we have three generations of women diagnosed with breast cancer on the same side of the family. 
two of those diagnoses have occurred from 40 or under, and we also have a diagnosis of ovarian cancer. So this family is looking concerning, and this would certainly be one where we would consider genetic testing. Whenever we um, see that genetic testing is indicated, we like to begin in the person that is the most likely person to have the genetic mutation in them. Um, the reason that we do that is because this result is, the, is then the most informative to other family members. So the diagnostic testing or that screening where we're looking at lots of different genes that might be involved with the family history starts in the person that's the most likely person for us. So in this family, it would probably be the woman who's been diagnosed with the ovarian cancer, if that's a much more rare cancer. Um, we would begin testing in her, and we would look at the several genes that could be linked with her diagnosis. If a mutation is found, testing then becomes available to other family members, so we can clarify who in that family are at risk of developing cancer, and potentially explain the diagnoses of cancer for some of those people in the family. So that's called predictive testing, where we're testing an individual to predict the likely risk of cancer over their lifetime. Once we've gathered all of that information, we're then able to provide screening recommendations for that family. We can do this if genetic testing isn't indicated, and we can also do this if we do genetic testing but don't identify a genetic mechanism. The information that we gather about the family history provides us with a really good picture of what the risks might be for those family members. So that takes into account familial cancers, um, those moderately increasing, uh, sorry, those genes which moderately increase your risk of cancer. Although we can't do testing for them, we can't exclude that they are at play in a family. And so we use the family structure to guide us around um, what the risks might be for individuals in the family. And then we provide general screening recommendations for the family based on that information. They are general screening guidelines um, that are developed um, through lots of international research. So although we give them to a family, we always say that individuals should take that information to their specialist um, because there are reasons that some people might be able to access different screening or earlier screening. So it's important that people get their screening specialised to them by their specialist. Um, then the next thing to talk about is direct-to-consumer testing, which is a kind of testing that I'm sure many of you have come across. It's testing which is accessible via the internet. You can kind of self-fund it. Um, you avoid going through the Genetic Health Service. Um, we would caution anyone who is considering taking this um, sort of testing option. Firstly, you don't come through a genetic service, so the tricky decision whether or not to have testing as well as the interpretation of those results is kind of done on your own. So you don't have a person with you to help you and guide you through the information that you're getting. But also because the data from these um, direct-to-consumer tests are only suitable really for research and education um, and information use, and they state often themselves that the information is not suitable for um, medical or diagnostic use. Um, so you're not always actually testing all the things that you think you're testing for, um, and the tests don't always cover everything. So 23andMe is an example. Um, they're at the moment are validated for testing only a few of the mutations that can occur in the BRCA1 or 2 genes. So I would really caution you on taking that step. I know it can seem like a really easy test to do, um, but part of the, the challenge around genetic testing is that it is a big decision with lots of implications and having the right people who facilitate that testing and assess whether that testing is indicated in your family um, is really helpful and it gives you an opportunity to talk through things that you might be concerned about or, um, yeah, the real implications of jumping into genetic testing. So to close off, um, here are some resources which I would recommend if you are looking into um, the genetics of, of, of your family history. The Centre for Genetics Education is an organisation in Australia. Um, they specialise in developing educational tools for a wide range of genetic conditions. So if you're interested in learning about inheritance or genetics or genetic testing, um, they're a really great place to go to. They also have contact details for Australian services. Um, there's lots of New Zealanders who have Australian family members. So they're a really great resource for lots of reasons. EVQ um, is a website that we use a lot. Um, the EVQ team is made up of a bunch of scientists and clinical experts who develop our guidelines around who can 
um, be referred for genetic testing, who's eligible for genetic testing or genetic assessment, um, as well as our screening recommendations. So they're a great resource to go and have a look at. If you're concerned about your family history, have a look through that information and see whether or not um, a referral is indicated. And then as has already been mentioned, the gift of knowledge is a great resource for those individuals who have been found to have a BRCA mutation or a high risk of breast or ovarian cancer. Um, there are other support groups available for different things, but within the breast cancer um, community, the gift of knowledge is a really great one, a place where you can meet others um, who might share similar experiences to you. Um, so that's all that I have to say <laughs> about that. Um, you're always welcome to contact us if you've got questions or concerns, but the best people to speak to are probably your GPs, um, as they can then facilitate a referral if you are concerned about your family history. Great. Thank you, Romy, and thanks so much to all four of you. We're now going to open up to questions from you guys at home. You can type questions in the box to the bottom left of your screen, and we'll get through as many as we can in, in the time available. We've got um, a few waiting, so go ahead and ask. Or, and I will just take a look at these and, and send them through. Now, um, this question has been partly covered. How much does testing cost <laughs> in New Zealand? So if you are eligible for genetic testing, so if you come through the Genetic Health Service and we find that uh, we think that genetic testing is indicated, then it's free. So you don't pay anything for the initial genetic counselling consultation, um, the genetic testing and the follow-up appointments. It's totally covered by the government. Um, there are private genetic testing services where you can access genetic counselling as well. Um, I'm not 100% sure of the cost if I don't work privately, <laughs> um, but I think that they're in the vicinity of a few hundred dollars plus consultation fees with a genetic counsellor. Yeah, I thought they were more than that. Is that they the could, price coming they down? Be. I guess the price <laughs> probably is coming down. Like, like <laughs> Yeah. It depends on the genetic testing you do. Um, you can also a lot more if you <laughs> feel inclined to. <laughs> right. um, now here's the question, how far back in a family line should you look for genetic mutations? Or Romy, you might have a view on that. <laughs> um, we generally go as far as the people are alive, um, so we can't test people who've passed away obviously, um, but certainly a genetic link can go back many, many, many generations. So it could be um, spread out sideways in terms of second cousins or cousins once removed or third cousins who could be at risk. So um, we can't necessarily test all those people above them, but we can test those people out to the side who might be at risk. Um, so the more information you have about your family, the more people who could potentially benefit from that genetic testing. But if... if um, say someone's dead, like a great yeah. great grandmother, but you do know that they died of breast cancer. Say, is that of interest, or you're not? Yeah, um, certainly it would be, and it, and we have to sometimes guess that where a genetic change may have come from, and um, we would probably follow. That, you know, if there was a family history of cancer on that side, that would be the most likely place. Um, and so then we would make a guess that that was where it might have come from. And um, we've talked about breast and ovarian cancers. Are there other cancers that people will talk to you about to decide whether or not? Yeah, um, so uh, bowel cancer, family history of um, bowel or ovarian or endometrial cancers can be linked with a genetic syndrome called Lynch syndrome. Um, there's also a genetic link between stomach and breast cancers. Um, that we can do genetic testing for, but again, they all we require lots of information. Not every family history with a breast or stomach cancer will have this genetic link, um, and there are a lot of others. Um, so rare cancers in particular could have a genetic link. Um, yeah. And we talked about um, about the um, paid for testing, the the online yeah. online testing. Um, and you said that they may not find all mutations. Maybe, Vanessa, can you tell us how many different BRCA mutations are there? <laughs> you know? How many unique BRCA mutations? Um, there are thousands of unique mutations, but not all of them are associated with risk. Right. And the thing is, we haven't found them all either. And so we, I like this, this is one of my friends says this, we're all mutants. We all carry genetic changes that aren't found in anyone else. 
And so that's why it's so important to test every family because they're likely to carry genetic changes that aren't found in other families and they may be present in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 um, genes. And so there will be infinite possibilities for the different changes present in BRCA1 and BRCA2, um, but at this stage the databases have several thousand that are currently known. And those other mutations that you mentioned, how common are they? The P3 and the oh, um, yeah. Yeah, so there are mutations in other breast cancer susceptibility genes that do increase your risk of developing breast cancer, and they are much less common than the ones in BRCA1 and BRCA2. They don't come up in testing as much. Um, currently in that study that I mentioned where I looked at almost 400 women, where we detected 21 of those women carrying BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, we identified one carrying a PALB2 mutation. And so they're much rarer, but the association with breast cancer, there is still some risk associated with them. And were you surprised at the number of people that had a mutation in that study? Or um, compared, no, it's pretty comparable to what's been found in similar studies overseas. It may be slightly higher, but it's very similar to what we would expect. So yes, yeah, so we wouldn't expect to find too many more. We've found the ones that were easiest to find, and now we're going to look at these other ones, which were the unclassified variants, see if they're also associated with risk, but we wouldn't expect to find too many more than what we found. Um, now we've got a more specific question from someone who um, has a BRCA1 mutation and, and has had breast cancer with a double mastectomy and oophorectomy. What kind of screening should she be having from now on? <laughs> Um, so there is, I mean, I would recommend speaking with a specialist if you have one who has been doing screening for you previously. Um, there is still some residual risk of, of a breast cancer following a mastectomy. It's not guaranteed that you get every single cell, although that risk is incredibly low and not anything like the risk of, of having breast, breast tissue present um, with the mutation. Um, recommendations are around um, Doing regular breast checks, um, it's much more difficult to do a mammogram once you've had your breast tissue removed. Um, so being aware of your chest area is really helpful. Unfortunately for um, other cancers associated with the BRCA1 and 2 genes, there isn't that much screening available. So a lot of it comes down to having good communication with your doctor, being really aware of yourself and any changes for yourself, and having a low threshold for reporting um, anything that is concerning for you. And I think Kirsty's point about having a GP who mm. understands mm. that. Yeah, yeah. So they, as soon as you come, as you say, having a low threshold. So as soon as you come in and say that doesn't doesn't feel quite right, then that sets the wheels in motion for any screening that you can have. And um, we've got a couple of questions about retesting for genetic mutations. Someone who's um, had a consultation with a geneticist who was told maybe they should be tested again in a couple of years. Um, why would that be and, and how often should people get tested? Yeah, um, so our technology is changing all the time and so some of the testing that we may have done in the early 2000s um, probably could be updated with better testing nowadays. So we may not have found anything then but we might be able to find something now as our technology and knowledge has improved. Um, so we always recommend coming back to the genetic service for a review. Our information is changing, our guidelines are changing, our knowledge of genes that cause increased risk is changing. Um, we don't have the capacity to contact you all ourselves, <laughs> so we recommend coming back to us because there could be other genetic testing indicated based on increased knowledge and better technology. Wow, so really people have had the test been very unclear what the if is this an issue. They, yeah. they could consider coming back. Yeah. And actually, I spoke to a woman recently who had had the testing just a couple of years earlier, and then her surgeon had sent her again for the testing just because of the high rate of cancer in that family. In the between times, would that a couple of years make a difference? Um, genetics moves quickly, um, so it could be that you were tested only a few years ago, but our testing has changed, and we now do panels and offer testing for more of those genes when a few years ago we just did BRCA1 and 2. Um, so sometimes nothing changes for a while and sometimes everything changes really quickly. So yeah, if you've got concerns, if you feel like you've lost touch with us, get back in touch. We keep files forever, so we have records for everyone. 
um, yeah, get back in touch and, and we will let you know whether there's updated information available and what other testing. And um, why can't we just test all breast cancer patients <laughs> for leukemia cases, or maybe all patients under 50 or something? It's a good question. I think we're moving in that direction. Um, one of the main reasons is, um, is financially. Uh, the government can't pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, if you don't find one of these genetic explanations for your cancer um, or for your family history, People might feel falsely reassured by that um, and may feel that the risk of developing a cancer is non-existent or very low. Um, and so sometimes genetic testing isn't that helpful. Um, it can also be quite complicated. We might find genetic information that is confusing, so the variants of uncertain significance that we don't actually know what to do with. Um, and that doesn't necessarily change a family or an individual's risk of cancer. So sometimes it's tricky. Um, and, and so we like to try and keep it as simple as we can by testing those people who are most indicated. But certainly things are moving towards that in maybe the next five or ten years. You know, we never know. And um, Vivian, did you ever seriously consider not going ahead with the surgery and so on? Um, no, I never really had that option because my husband's amazing and he always said that he wouldn't care if I had all my woman bits taken away as, as long as I got to essentially be able to be there for him and our family and, you know, live a long life. So it made it really easy because I didn't have to worry about anything and I had a massive support from all my family. So, yeah, it never crossed my mind. I kind of figured, you know, they're trying to kill me so I'll get there first. <laughs> <laughs> And um, did either of you have family members who didn't want to be tested at all? I do have a family member who has chosen not to get tested um, for personal, their own personal reasons. So obviously I didn't include them in because I don't mm -hmm. want to label yeah, them yeah. out. And everyone has that right because, you know, mm -hmm. some of us just aren't ready in the headspace to be able to deal with the results. So mm -hmm. it, it's, personal, it's just a personal choice really in the end. How about you? Where everyone got tested pretty much straight away. Um, there might have been a period of just sort of understanding, you know, actually what they were going to do with the result, but inevitably they all got tested. Um, is your view that many people decide not to have the testing after you've talked to them about it? Um, I don't know if many, um, but certainly. Yeah, there are people who choose not to know this information, and we talk about that. We talk about timing. So, for example, you know, if you're in the middle of a breast cancer treatment, is now the right time right. to go through that? Um, yeah. So we, the genetic counsellors, talk through um, what information you want and how you'll use that information, and is it going to have um, a significant impact on you psychologically? Is it going to impact relationships with family members? All of those things are worth considering and yeah, there's definitely people who choose not to have that information. Um, now getting a bit more specific again, here's someone who says, I've just had a mastectomy for breast cancer, I'm 65, my mother had breast cancer at 56 and my sister at 30, I have two daughters aged 40 and 38 and I'm wondering if I should get gene tested. Um, definitely refer to us. <laughs> um, I can't. <laughs> I can't answer that question um, just off the bat. We would need more information exactly about, um, specifically about the kinds of breast cancer that are being diagnosed. Um, sometimes that informs us of which gene to consider, um, but sometimes it does give us more information about whether or not it's reassuring. Um, in that instance, if genetic testing were indicated, then your sister was the person with the earliest diagnosis at 30. Mm. Um, and so that would possibly be the person we would be interested in starting with. Um, so yeah, talk to your GP and ask for a referral. Um, and which types of breast cancer are most likely to be genetic? <laughs> um, so triple negative breast cancer is associated with the BRCA mutation. <laughs> um, and there's a triple positive breast cancer before 30, can be linked with the TB53 gene. Um, but otherwise, it's it's difficult to tell always. Um, certainly lobular breast cancers are linked with 
can be linked with other genes that are not necessarily BRCA1 or 2. Um, so we gather that information and then make an assessment based on the whole family as well. Um, so there can be people who have other breast cancers diagnosed that are not triple negative and have a BRCA mutation. So yeah, <laughs> not a straightforward answer. <laughs> And um, if someone, which we've already mentioned, PAL B2, can we get testing for the PAL B2 mutation? Is that one you need? Yeah, so anyone who qualifies for genetic testing is offered a panel um, now, which includes BRCA1 and 2, um, PAL B2, a gene called ACM, and CP53. Um, and then there might be other information in the family which could indicate including other genes, and we would talk about that. Now here's someone who says, I've had private genetic testing which showed I have a non-specific variation of, of BRCA, uh, which is something we've talked about a bit tonight. What exactly are the ramifications? I was also diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer in 2016. Do you want to answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> well, unclassified variants, we don't know what the risk associated with these variants is, so it's very difficult to say if that variant is caused that breast cancer or whether it didn't cause that cancer. And so further work needs to be done on these particular variants, which is partly what we're trying to do and um, the work that I'm trying to do. And so until we really understand the risk behind that variant, um, it can't be used for um, treatment options or advising about um, if you should have surgery to lower your risk or not, because it may have no association with that disease at all. And so. If you are able to get it looked at, like get involved in the study, we'd welcome we'd welcome it in our study to look at it in more detail to try and understand the risk for it. But otherwise, yeah, I can't really say too much more. So I thought you only take people who have already got a confirmed mutation. Or she said, was that not an, was that not a unclassified variant? Um, oh yes, sorry, you were, yes, sorry, it was quite sorry, it was an unclassified variant and bracket two. Yep, yep, yep. Great. Okay, so that she could get an on yep, the, she could definitely um, get in touch. on your breast cancer website. Yep, and, um, get in touch, that'd be great. Yep, excellent. Okay. Um, I have the BRCA2 gene, and one of my two sons has been tested and is positive. The other one hasn't been tested. What can men do in this situation? Um, yeah, so for men, the risks of breast cancer are are increased, but not the same extent as a woman with a BRCA mutation. And men typically have much less breast tissue. So um, a mammogram is not a great tool for breast cancer detection for men. Um, so there's not a lot in terms of their screening, but again, I would recommend a good relationship with a GP who's aware of the risk. Um, having a really good understanding of their own chest area. So um, men might be more inclined to brush off something that's um, you know, a lump or something that's changed in their chest area. Um, so being willing to report that and having a good relationship with the GP um, is, is really helpful. Um, then having a regular prostate check from around the age of 40 um, is, is recommended as well. So having a, a digital exam and a PSA blood test um, are helpful measures for prostate cancer. Um, um, so, if there is no live relative to test, people can't get a test here, or are they? No. Um, so, we certainly take into account things like um, adoption, or if everyone has passed away, that comes into our family history assessment as well. Um, if on one side of the family there's only men, for example, as well, that can also be part of our assessment. Um, so we take we take everything into account, and potentially we can offer testing to individuals who are at a high enough risk of a mutation based on that family history information. Um, that testing can be more complicated, and so that's why we we require sort of a higher threshold um, before offering testing. But we can test individuals who who haven't had a cancer history if it's indicated. And someone's asked, which may or may not be a related question, could I be tested with no known issues at present? I guess that, whether that not means through, no one in the family or... Yeah, yeah. Not, not through us. If there's no family history, um, we do clinically driven testing, so testing based on family history information. Um, if 
there is a family history but there's no one else to test, then like I said, there could be reason for us to be able to test you. Um, yeah, that's kind of moving into the realm of private genetic testing if you're wanting testing as a well individual with no family history and that's outside the scope of the public system. Um, and in terms of um, if you do have a BRAC mutation and you want to avoid passing that on to um, to descendants and um, one can have IVF and that kind of thing? Okay. Uh, yeah, so there are reproductive um, options available. Um, there is a testing process called um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or PGD which is IVF with genetic testing of the embryo. Um, that is publicly funded in New Zealand for individuals with a BRCA mutation. Um, however, there is a two, 18 months to two year waiting list for that. So some people don't feel that they've got time to sit around and wait for that to have children, um, you know, particularly if they're making decisions about breast surgery or ovarian surgery. Um, but it is something that the Genetic Health Service can facilitate. So if that is the situation, then you're welcome to contact us and we can um, facilitate that process. And we've had a question about how do I get genetic counselling. Well, we've already talked about um, the GP and also here our breast care nurses at Breast Cancer Foundation. We'll be putting some details up to that later. Any other, any other ways to go about it? I guess um, for some people, their oncologist or whatever, if they've had a diagnosis and their specialist will yeah. refer them or their surgeon. Yeah, and if you have a family member who you know has come through the genetic service, you can also contact us yourself. Oh, okay. Um, Okay, information about the criteria for genetic screening. You've already mentioned the AVQ yep. website. That's the best place to go to, so it's, the link is on my slide. Um, but you can just find it by searching AVQ, E-V-I-Q. Okay, um, we're pretty much still. Everything? Great. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for joining us here tonight. It's been really great having you all watching. It looks like there's been lots of conversation going on. Um, if you've missed some of the answers to questions and things, the, we the webinar will be on our website in a few days' time. Um, we hope you found it helpful and would really appreciate it if you could take a minute to complete the exit survey as you leave the webinar. If you think you might be interested in a referral to Genetic Health Service or, or you might be eligible or if you have any questions about anything else breast cancer related, our nurses will take your call on our 0800 line. I'll just click through to that there. Yep, so you can reach our nurses on um, that number there tomorrow or on that email address um, and they can talk to you about that. They can also provide to our free counselling. We do offer free counselling to people who do have a confirmed BRCA or other breast cancer related genetic mutation. Um, and, and if you've had breast cancer or you're currently being treated, we can connect you into our online community for breast cancer patients as well. Um, in the next few days, we'll send you a link to the recording of the webinar. And if you'd like to recommend it to somebody else, please do. Thank you again for joining us and good night. Good night. Good night.